For most people, they've heard, if they've been around church for a little while, uh, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon is probably known as one of the greatest orators as a minister in London, England during the 19th century. He preached at the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle in London, and there he had a profound ministry of preaching to thousands. He wrote hundreds of letters. His sermons fill 60-plus volumes. And he was a man who was a student of the Word, who loved God. But he was also a man, in spite of all of the outward successes, who, who suffered tremendously. At the age of 22, in an evening service, when Charles Spurgeon was just starting off in ministry and he was preaching, some heckler called out in, in some sort of joking fashion, FIRE! To which thousands of people who were there gathered, got up, and a stampede ensued. And seven people were killed because of the stampede, because of a joking heckler. Spurgeon would say that for the rest of his life, he, he never got over that moment. He, he would struggle with depression. Zach Eswine has written a book called Spurgeon's Sorrows, and, and in it he recounts how, how Spurgeon, Spurgeon was so affected by, by the darkness that just would never lift. Yes, he was a man of God, and yes, he would have great oratory skills, and yes, he would have great insights, but he would fight what Winston Churchill would call the black dog. He would face enormous slander in his ministry and people who would question him and his philosophy of ministry and the direction of ministry. He would suffer from rheumatoidism. He would have gout bouts that would cause him great pain. He would have an inflamed kidney. His wife, Susanna, would be invalid in her early 30s, and she would rarely be able to attend Sunday morning services or Sunday night services to hear her husband preach, but rather be bedridden from an early age. And Spurgeon's sufferings would go on until he would die at the age of 57 and be home with the Lord. Spurgeon would comment about his darkness and the pressure that was going on and the depression that he would face, and he would say, my spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I knew not what I wept for. For him, it was a very real and dark and trying experience that he would go through. And yet, what James wants to write to us is that there is joy to be considered even in the face of trials. Consider it or count it pure joy or the purest of joy when you face trials of various kinds, James will say, because you know that the testing of your faith is producing a steadfastness, and steadfastness must have its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And we might bristle when we hear these words, count it joy when you face trials. But James knows that in order for us to be countercultural, that we have to proceed in a way that is different from how people typically respond to difficulties. In a day and age where we are often thinking that we are entitled to the good and the happy life that is suffering free, or as Great Big C would sing, I want to be consequence free, we, we have to face the reality, and James wants us to face the reality that there are sufferings of various and many types. They are incredibly painful and incredibly hard. And James wants us to know how to proceed with joy this morning rather than complaining. And in order to be countercultural, not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed, then instead of complaining to be the general note of the believer, it ought to be joy that comes from us. Let's consider two ways that James is encouraging us to count it all joy. So first, I want us to see how we joyfully grow in endurance. That's the first thing I want us to see from verses 2 and 3. James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, could you imagine if someone came to you and said, I want you to just be joyful because you're suffering. 
If someone came to you and, and, and quoted these verses when you were facing all kinds of difficulties, if you had just lost your job, oh, just put your chin up. Consider it joy that you lost your job. You've got a cancer diagnosis? You should smile. We would think they were absolutely crazy, wouldn't we? We, we would think you are so far from reality. You have so distanced yourself from what is real and true and right. The purpose of these verses is not for us to go, yay, trials, but they're to help us to understand what God is doing in the midst of great difficulty. For Spurgeon, he would consider in the midst of his sufferings, in the midst of his despairs, how he could learn to endure. He would often be quoted as, and I think this quote is attributed to him, though I don't know if it's accurate that it is Spurgeon, but it is supposed that he has said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. How do you learn to kiss the wave that throws you against the rock of ages? When you feel like you are being thrown against the, sto the, the stone that is going to shatter you, what is it? For most of us, when we suffer, we just feel like, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. I I'm just trying to survive. And now you're telling me, be joyful? How, how can that be? How can you consider that to be a real possibility? Again, I think Spurgeon is helpful because if we understand that every trial has come from the hand of a sovereign God, a God who rules and reigns over all things, then we can understand why Charles Spurgeon could have joy and say he could kiss the wave that would cast him against the rock of ages. Spurgeon would write, this has been a quote that has often been on, on our refrigerator at our house with a magnet on top of it to remind us of these things. Spurgeon says it would be, a, sh a very sharp and trying experience to me to think that I have an affliction which God never sent me, that the bitter cup was never filled by His hand, that my trials were never measured out by Him, nor sent to me by His arrangement of their weight and quantity. And what Spurgeon means by that is, is that because God is sovereign, that we don't face an unlimited amount of suffering, but it has been measured out for us in the hand of God that has been weighed, it's been calculated, that, that just as Spurgeon understands this, that we could rejoice in the sufferings of this life because they're limited, they're measured. You see, for the Christian, the suffering of this life, it's actually the most hell that a Christian will ever experience. Let that stop and, and let that sink into you for a moment. The most hell that a Christian will ever experience is the sufferings in this life. That's it. That God has designed and prepared for us an eternal weight of glory. And so James can say rejoice. And why can James say rejoice? Because the trial has come not to harm you, not to destroy you, but to strengthen you. Again, I want you to hear Spurgeon. He says, I have looked back to times of trial with a kind of longing, not to have them return, but to feel the strength of God as I have felt it then, to feel the power of faith as I have felt it then, to hang upon God's powerful arm as I hung upon it, and to see God at work as I saw Him then. Some of those times where we experience the most powerful moments of the grace and kindness of God has been in the face of trials. It's the times where we have to trust Him the most. And in facing those trials, James says, I want you to consider it pure joy when you meet trials. Now that word meet has a very important sense because you're not going out and going and looking for trials. That, that's not the point. It's not, I want to be happy, so I'm going to figure out how I can suffer. That's, that's just being a masochist. That's not Christianity. What James says is, I want you to be joyful 
when you meet those trials, when you encounter them. In other words, by merely walking through this life in a Genesis 3 world full of sin and brokenness, you're going to encounter difficulties. You're going to encounter hardships. And the hardships that he describes, he says, are of various kinds. Certainly for this congregation that James is writing to, there is a sense probably of being scattered and persecuted, and with that comes economic difficulties, it comes with relational difficulties, it comes with being socially dislocated, it comes from being physically dislocated, it, it comes with all sorts of stresses and hardships that can affect the body. And so when James writes and he says, consider it pure joy, when, when, when you're going through life and you meet these encounters of trials of various kinds... They're different types and they're different kinds. And he uses this word trials that they have come to you. That what they are doing is that these trials are coming. Now the word here trial can also be translated as tempted. It's the same word that will be used, but it depends on the context. Just like we have words that they mean one thing in one context and they mean a different in another context. Here, when James says, when you meet trials or temptations of various kinds, what he means is that God has not designed struggles for you so that you would fail. He has designed trials for you to strengthen you, to give you endurance. You can see that in this verse that you consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds because you know that the testing of your faith, what is it producing, James says? It's producing steadfastness or endurance. And this becomes so critical. If you get up tomorrow morning and you go, I want to start running, I am going to begin by running 26.2 miles. I'm going to run a marathon. I guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of people are not going to be able to get up tomorrow morning if they've never run before and just run a marathon. What happens is you have to be training, you have to be testing, you, you start off with, with a, a kilometer and your intervals and you're getting a little bit faster and you go and you do wind sprints and you change the speed and you have to hydrate yourself and you have to condition yourself and over time you, you're going to hit this wall and you're going to go, I can't go any further. Now, I'm the only non-runner in, uh, in my family of origin, all of my siblings are runners so I had to go to them to find out all of these great tips. <laughs> they said, there's always a point where you hit a wall. And when you hit that wall, you've got to push and you've got to go through that wall. Now, I believe that because one of my brothers is an ultra marathon runner, meaning that he's running over 50 miles in various times. And so there's points where you, you hit the wall and you've got to endure and you've got to persevere. There's this feeling like, I just want to give up. And it's at that point where God's grace comes to us, meets us, strengthens us, but it takes more and more testing. At first, you start with running a kilometer or two or five or ten. Then you run a half marathon three quarters of a marathon, and then soon you're running those 40 plus kilometers to run a full marathon. You're not happy about the trials. You're not happy about how the lactic acids are feeling in your legs. You're not happy about how sore you feel, but the endorphins that come to you as you run, right? There's, there's a sense of pleasure and happiness that comes. And this is what trials are intended to do. God has designed trials so that you grow in faith, that each trial takes you deeper in your trust of Him and deeper in your trust of Him and deeper still. So that once, what once was just a little bit of faith becomes a bit more faith and it becomes greater faith because every trial God is intending not for your failure but your success. I remember uh, in my first pastorate, an older widow I had gone to visit her quite often, and she had married, and they, she and her husband had lived in small towns across nor, uh, northern Ontario at various points, and they had found themselves childless, which was a grief and a sorrow for them. Her husband died at a young age, and he died in an occupation where he didn't become wealthy and he didn't have the kind of success. And she had to move suddenly in life without 
a husband and try to return to a very small family without much support networks. And as I sat with her on one occasion, I listened to her and she said, you know, Andrew, I, fa I was faced with a choice in my life. I could either become bitter or I could become better. And I chose to become better. And it stuck with me as I listened to her about how she had faced these trials of various kinds. Because when trials come to us, what often happens is we start to ask the wrong questions. Why is this happening to me? Why do I deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? Why is God angry with me? And those, I want to suggest to you, that when those questions come to you, they come straight from the pit of hell itself. Because God does not intend to test and try you for failure, but for success. And so whenever we ask, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Why is God angry? There is actually the lurking suspicion that somehow God is against us and not for us. And yet what James says here is that we consider it joy when we face trials of various kinds because we know that what God is doing is He is working out something for our eternal good, our eternal joy, our eternal happiness, that He is working those spiritual muscles so that we would have that kind of fortitude of faith. And that the trials that maybe you faced in your teens, in your 20s, by your 30s, in your 40s, you're experiencing more so that by the time you're in your 70s and 80s, Lord willing, that you have a robust and strong faith. That's what God intends. He intends to grow you and strengthen you and equip you. And it doesn't mean it's going to be all roses and sunshine and puppies. That often there is going to be great hardships because God so loves you that He wants your spiritual muscles to be able to flex more and to be stronger and to endure more. Consider it pure joy, not because you are joyful about the trials, but because you're joyful about what God's doing. Like Spurgeon could say, he could look and he could see how God was strengthening by faith, that he rejoiced in the trials because God had been closer, God had been nearer, God had come to him in a way that was profound. We don't get excited about the trials, but we know that what God is doing is he makes every purpose serve his good. Every difficulty, every hardship. It feels like I'm just trying to keep my nose above water and God is going, yes, and I am going to make you stronger in faith, in hope, and in love. Now that's what we need to be reminded of when times are good, so that when times are hard, that we can be prepared for them. And so James writes to this congregation because trials are producing a maturity and that's the second thing I want us to see this morning, is that we're not just joyfully growing in endurance, but James wants us to joyfully grow in maturity. James will use this word, that steadfastness must have, verse 4, its full effect. Now this word, steadfast, James, we know, is very familiar with the teachings of Jesus. He has rooted all of his teachings in Jesus, in fact. This is just a reworking of Leviticus 19 and a reworking of the Sermon on the Mount. This is what the book of James is. It's a working out of the law of the kingdom. And as James works it out, when he uses this word steadfast, there are two places where the exact same word is used by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15, as Jesus talks about the different types of soils, he says there's good soil and there's rocky soil and there's hard soil and there's soil where there's thorns and thistles that grow. He says that the good soil, it produces fruit when it endures. It's the same word that James uses when he talks about being steadfast. It's the exact same word. And as a result of that, what James is saying is that if, you, if you're going to see good fruit in your life, you're going to have to go through trials. Because what the trials do, it's just like when you prune an apple tree. You're hacking away the branches. I remember when I had an apple tree in my yard and, and someone said to me, 
you ought to be able to cut off a third of the branches and be able to take your hat and throw it through the tree, and then you know that you've cut off enough branches. And I hacked and pruned an apple tree, and I thought, oh my goodness, I think I've decimated this tree. Now, thankfully, apple trees are very resilient. I know that because when I was a kid, I ran over an apple tree with a lawnmower of my grandfather's, and it became the most fruitful apple tree that he ever had. He asked me to run over every single apple tree that he had with his lawnmower, which I didn't do. But when you see how that pruning can shape and affect and cause great fruit, Peter will talk about how the, these are like fiery trials in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. He'll say that these fiery trials have come upon you so as to refine your faith. So it's like a, a fine, precious metal that's been heated up. And as it's being heated up, that, that the, the dross, the impurities, they rise to the surface so that they can be skimmed off and so that you can have a gold that has been tested and refined as like fire. And that's the kind of faith that Peter talks about, which is the same type of idea here, that this is what endurance is producing, this steadfastness. But James, interestingly, he bookends his, his, his letter with this idea of steadfastness. He starts off in chapter 1, verse 2, by talking about steadfastness, and he'll end his letter by coming back to this idea of steadfastness. He'll talk about a man by the name of Job in chapter 5, verse 11, that Job had steadfastness of faith. And if you know the character of Job, or if you don't know him, he was a wealthy man, a prosperous man in the time of Abraham. And he was so wealthy and so powerful and so mighty that he had been faced with this great trial that Satan had come and brought great destruction upon him, limited by the hand of God, as we know from Job chapters 1 and 2. God had set out the measures and the limits of that trial. And so Job had lost all of his sons and daughters. He had lost all of his wealth. He had lost his health and physical strength. And the only thing that is left for us in terms of what Job had was a wife who said to him, curse God and die. That was all that he was left with. And yet, when Job's friends would come to him and they would sit in silence and they would finally speak, and they would tell him, well, surely you've done something wrong. God must be punishing you because you've done something wrong. Job would stand in faith and he would stand in endurance. And in Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, he would say, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Here in the face of all the trials, Job stood steadfast. And this is what James is calling us to. He is calling us to a steadfastness because what that steadfastness will produce, the ESV, I think it's a little bit unfortunate, but it says that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking in anything. And I think that word perfect maybe can throw us. It's not a wrong translation. Or it's probably not the most helpful. This idea of what James has in mind is is this, it's, it's the word teleos. It's the word, the end goal that, that suffering has in mind. That God has an end goal in mind for you. And that end goal in mind, James will talk about this several places. He'll talk about it in chapter 1, verse, um, verse 4, verse 17, verse 25, chapter 2, verse 22, chapter 3, verse 2. And in each sense, it has this idea of maturity. That the purpose that God has for you in the face of trials is He wants you to be like Jesus. He wants you to look more like Jesus. He wants you to be more gracious like Jesus, more gentle, more compassionate, more loving. He wants you to have the kind of confessional faith that works itself out in action. And as a result of that, that when James has this idea of being mature, this is the refining process that God's refining for us is preparing 
us for the future. That what God has in mind for you and for me in the face of trials, in the face of difficulties, is a glorious future. And because it's a glorious future, He doesn't want you to show up unprepared for that glorious future. What is that future that He has in store? James is very much thinking the way that he heard Jesus speak in Matthew chapter 5. That Jesus would speak of these blessings that come to us. Jesus would say in Matthew 5 verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now you don't just accept any old accusation. Because some accusations can be true. Sometimes we're jerks. <laughs> and Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you when you're persecuted because you act like a jerk. He says, when, you're, when you are persecuted on account of my name, rejoice and be glad. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus understands that to pick up your cross daily and follow Him is not going to be a joy-filled experience. That the cost of a cross is a painful experience, but it is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. And that eternal weight of glory, James can look and he can look at Jesus who walked this very path himself. That the writer of Hebrews the writer of Hebrews would say that Jesus himself, he had to endure hardships. Speaking of Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, to most of us, we don't understand who is this guy Melchizedek and what's that all about. But Jesus, simply put, he learned obedience through suffering so that he might be designated, or we could use the word ordained, to become a high priest in the order of, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. The word melech in Hebrew is the, that word king, and zedek has that idea of righteousness. And so when you hear the word Melchizedek, it is the name, he is the king of righteousness. And Jesus had to suffer and learn obedience so that he could be ordained to that kingship called the king of righteousness. That Jesus had been designated with a throne to rule and to reign. And as a result of that, the apostle Paul could write the same type of idea in 2 Timothy he would tell Timothy that he needed to endure hardships as a good soldier. For what reason? Paul would say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.12, these words, If we endure, we will also reign with him. And this idea of being enduring or having steadfastness, the same word, is intended for us to become the kings and queens that rule and reign with God forever. Why are you suffering now? Because the future that God has for you is as kings and queens who rule in the age to come. So what's a little bit of suffering now? If you're going to wear a crown for the future, a little bit of cross right now is not so bad. If all the hell that we experience is here so that we will rule in the new creation forever and ever, then endure sufferings as a soldier, knowing that what it is producing is it's producing for you an eternal weight of glory, a reward that is forever, that you will rule and reign with God forever. Now, you need that if you're going to face trials of many kinds. And you need to have the right perspective because if you don't, you're going to go, why does God hate me? When in fact what he is doing is he is doing, I hadn't planned to go to Lamentations 3, but Jeremiah, as he laments over the destruction of Jerusalem, in Lamentations 3, there's some of the most famous verses 
that talk about how the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Great is His faithfulness. And, Je- and Jeremiah will continue in his lamentation in, in Lamentations 3.31, and he will say, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though He cause grief, He will have compassion according to abundance of His steadfast love, for He does not afflict from His heart or grieve the children of men. In other words, what God is doing is He is not afflicting you willingly, joyfully, happily, but He knows what it takes to produce spiritual muscle so that you can have the kind of maturity that can rule and reign forever. And so as James writes, he writes about the same thing that Jesus had to endure and face, that Jesus went to a cross He was destined for a cross. He was ordained to a cross. He chose a cross. Who for the joy, Hebrews 12, 2 will say, set before him, he endured. There's that word being steadfastness. He endured the cross, despising its shame. And why did he do that? Because he knew that in suffering, he might bring many sons and daughters to glory. And as he brings many sons and daughters to glory, he brings many sons and daughters to glory who will rule and reign with him forever. And what we are going to inherit, as Hebrews 12, 28 describes, it's a kingdom that cannot spoil or fade. That we store up treasures in earth, Jesus will say, where neither moths nor rust can destroy, nor thieves can break in and steal. But we set our hearts there because as we prepare our hearts, what God is producing is an eternal weight of glory. So as James writes to people who have lost power, who have lost cultural influence, who have lost cultural significance, James says, consider it pure joy when you face the trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And endurance must have its full work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Because when we endure, what God produces in us is the ability to say like Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Lord, we pray that what you would produce in us is that kind of steadfastness and robustness of faith. We need it in these days where Christianity is no longer considered the dominant religion, but now considered a minority, in some cases even considered evil. Would you help us to endure? Would you give us robustness of faith so that we might have those spiritual muscles to be prepared to rule and reign with you now and forever. So we sing to you, the God who gives, the God who takes away, the God who is working, not for our momentary joy, but for our forever joy. We sing our praises to you in your son's name, the one who endured the cross, the one who took it for us. We ask these things.